<coughs> Hello everyone. Good, I guess for most of the world, good evening. I hope you're having a great weekend. It's Monday morning here in Hong Kong. It's 8.30 a.m. Sorry for starting on the half hour today. Uh, there seems to be construction noise every day kicking off here at 9 a.m. So I thought, seeing we don't have that many entries today, I will start now and hopefully we can get done before the noise hits top gear. Hi to Carlos. Uh, if you're in the room, say hi. Let us know where you're coming in from. Do you have a shot in the competition? Tell us a bit about yourself. It's always great to hear from you guys. Um, if this is your first time joining us, as usual, we throw up the competition theme over at, I'll just pop it in the chat as well, um, mattgranger.com forward slash live. And that will be updated with what the competition theme is and how to enter your shot for the month. And then I pull them off, uh, get all of the images downloaded, and as soon as I can in the new month, um, we run the live judging. So that's what this is. Hi to Steve. Um, today we're looking at your travel themed photos and I made it clear when I announced this theme that <clears throat> it's not only, you know, traditional travel photography style shots where, you know, you're backpacking through Europe or Southeast Asia and taking photos of the culture. It could be anything to do with travel. So it could be uh, just off the top of my head, it could be to do with packing suitcases or a toddler having a, a tantrum in an airport or being crammed in a seat or anything like that. Or it could be the more traditional stuff. So as long as it's somehow related to travel, then it qualifies as an entry. And then I'll be judging which I think is the best image overall. Now, hi, Alan Madsden. I just put in the chat um, what our prizes are for today. Um, basically, I'm going to be giving away a copy of my travel photography guide to our runner-up and a copy of my Natural and Available Light Masterclass to the winner. I thought that kind of makes sense. The winner probably, well, maybe doesn't, won't, will get less from the the travel photography guide, but natural and available light is what we're often working with when we're doing more traditional travel photography rather than interrupting the moment by adding flash or continuous light to the scene. So I threw up on Instagram a graphic asking for any questions that you guys had, and I have had a few come in, so I will get to those maybe halfway through judging the photos. If you have any other questions, please throw them into the chat and I'll get to them there. But let's jump in and take a look at, oh, well, I actually have uh, the pages up for the prizes we're giving away. So first prize, the Natural and Available Light Masterclass. This is really, really long and comprehensive and it runs you through all kinds of different techniques for getting great, interesting shots with the available light, of course. Available light can be beautiful and flattering or it can be really challenging. So how to work with that to get the best results. And then travel photography, which is a more express guide, but about how to tell the story of a place in images. So let's now take a look at the travel shots that we had entered. Now we only had a bit over a dozen entries. Um, so I'm going to go through them here one by one without the names, give you my feedback on them, and then we'll reveal the, the names of our finalists at the end. So this to me is a very familiar scene. I don't know this exact game. I guess they're trying to roll it and have, at first I thought maybe to avoid the bottles, but now I'm actually thinking because the bottles are all full, um, it could be that you're trying to see if the wheel will fall over one of the bottles, and if it does, then you win it. So it's kind of amazing that it's stuff like rum and beer, hopefully, that have been refilled with soft drink. But it's monks and children playing the game. Um, I don't know exactly where this is. If I had to guess, I'd say, like, uh, 
Himalayas, but somewhere south, like maybe the Bengal area. Um, I, I really like it. it. The placement of the wheel is perfect. It gives you a real sense of the place, especially having been to places like this. I can just un imagine the sound and the kind of atmosphere. Um, I'm going to start off strong with the pick. Okay, um, so this is a real kind of postcard type shot. Some real effort has been taken here in framing this up. We've got the nice warm, I'm guessing late afternoon sun, which when you're traveling through the center of Australia, the warm sun is a real thing. Uh, you've got the guy riding the camel statue, nicely kind of silhouetted and in open space. The name of the train, the Garn, just in frame. Um, a lot working for it, I would say. Minor things, because it's such a careful composition, I would probably get this pole that's right here on the edge of frame out. Oh, what have I done? I don't need to develop, but sure, why not? Uh, keeping your crop, it could be as simple as that. That gets that off the edge of the frame. Um... I think the overall exposure could come up a little and you could enrich the, enrich in the like bring the, the blues out in the sky a little bit more, but overall, I think it's a nicely balanced shot and for some reason, names just came on there, so well done, Ian. Okay. Now, just... Mm, this one I actually used as the thumbnail for our uh, competition. Now, I want to make sure we don't have... No, good, that's the original crop. Um, I know where this area is quite well. It's... Um, I think it's a good amount of movement. When you're judging what shutter speed you should actually use, it really comes down to how's the movement in the shot, what's the speed of what you're shooting. If you're shooting a river, if it's just a little trickle, then having a one second exposure may not show much movement. But if it's an absolute torrent, like powering a, a water turbine, then you might find that a hundredth of a second you get really nice movement. It's the same with traffic. If it's a traffic jam, then shooting at two seconds, they may all still seem stationary. But if, they're, if the lights are green and they're moving, then you know you could get down to a 60th or 30th that kind of speed and still get some nice movement just depends what blend you want uh, in the background you can see by the sun stars in the headlights that this was shot down at like f22 or something like that to get the exposure um, so i think the movement of the cars the movement of the train and then the how busy the movement is in the background it all works quite well, so another pick. Um, okay, so this guy is literally traveling in the image. Now, having him not overlapping the St. Cross Road, I think is good. But just if he were, like, see we've got this S-bend in the road. If he were slightly back, you could have him perfectly in there. I do think overall... If the if we could just do anything we wanted in the shot, and if you'd been able to time it slightly earlier, having the crop up about here, but having him back just around here, I think the the image would balance just a little bit better. But having him against this bright part of the building definitely means that we've got a nice crisp silhouette of his face, which works well. Um, so, yeah, nice and a nice take on the theme of travel. I'll take a look at what... My Google Home is spying on me even though I didn't talk to her. Um, I'll check out one or two more and then get to your questions. Hi to JR and Marcialano. Thanks for joining us, gentlemen. Okay. Wow, what a place to be in the world. Um, 
Again, choosing a shutter speed here that I think is just about perfect. So we've got some movement in the water, not too much movement in the cloud or the trees. Uh, I think the water does look good having that little bit of texture going on. The, just something that really jumps out at me is the masking, even on the wide shot without zooming in, is a pretty sloppy. Have a look at this tree. Sorry to shame whoever this is. But you see how we've got all of this haloing around the trees and then all in here inside the tree hasn't been caught. And it looked like on the wide shot that over here the tips of the mountain have been caught as well. So I think the, the sky's been darkened down a good stop or so. But it's mainly that part that really jumps out as having a huge halo. So just be a little bit more careful on that. I think this is a, a beautiful frame. Um, I like the custom crop on it as well. Um, yeah, and the shutter speed selection is great too. We had some really strong entries this week. Makes it a challenge because we have fewer overall entries but so many great entries. Um, yeah. This is a familiar feeling. You're either one of the people rushing, trying to get to the next place, or one of the people pausing to check your maps, have a chat, and feeling like you're getting in the way when you're standing near a station or something like that. Um, I think it works well. It would be great if this guy wasn't uh, right on the edge of frame, if we just had a little bit of space. But I like the, again, the great choice of the amount of movement in the shot. Not completely blurring the people out, but also in this kind of a situation, it's kind of like if you were shooting, having some cars moving and others not, or uh, a, a moving stream and then there's a deer drinking from the stream. You want a shutter speed that's fast enough to pretty much capture the things you want sharp, sharp, those that aren't moving around whilst getting the movement in the areas where you want it. So here, getting the three characters that aren't moving close to sharp with the other people nicely streamed out, you have to be careful with your shutter speed there. If you take like a two or three second exposure, the people who are meant to be still will have fidgeted around and blurred out anyway. So again, nicely done. Um, let's jump back and take a look. My shirt looks so tight. Let's jump back and take a look at our any questions we have. I don't see any coming in from the room. If you have any, please let me know. I'll take a look at a couple from the Instagram page. David Stevens, in your long and ranging career, what is or was your least enjoyable moment or genre of photography? Um, and there's more to it, so I'll just read the whole thing. Um, I started in family stuff for my family and paid work, and I absolutely love that. I've moved into wedding, and again, I really enjoy the majority of a wedding day. I don't enjoy a lot of pose stuff, personally, as I like to capture natural moments. So yeah, what about you? Interesting. Um, now, I don't want to suggest that I am... <clears throat> Uh, just further down the path than you, but it, it sounds like it in a way, but you may have been doing this way longer than I have, but it's where you are sounds like exactly where I was a few years ago, so I'm really glad to hear that it's working for you. Um, I also started out shooting events and weddings and basically anything to do with people, and I preferred to shoot spontaneous, not posed stuff, I'll be honest though, for myself, the reason that I avoided post stuff was, and went for candid stuff was, that I wasn't confident with posing people. And once I got past that and worked on it, then it all kind of opened up and then the idea of things being posed no longer seemed uh, like cheating. It seemed like another skill that I had. Um, not saying that that's you or that that's other people who say this, but for myself, and I've, I've experienced this at the workshops that I run, that often when people say they prefer using 
natural light only. It's partly a preference and partly because they haven't learned how to use flash. When people prefer to only do candid stuff, it's because they're not confident or experienced with posing. Um, or they haven't kind of built that skill of being able to interact and direct people. So, to your question, what is your... Well, why, I don't know why we have to take the negative on things, like what's my least enjoyable moment or genre of photography rather than favourite. Um, but least enjoyable genre of photography or moment. I would guess something that I'm just not interested in is like still life, setting up a scene full of bowls of fruit and that kind of thing and shooting it. Followed by, I do occasionally do some macro. I've done macro work in the past. I occasionally still do it now. But I would say macro and product photography don't really interest me. I, do, I am still more interested in shooting people. Um, having said that, in the past three or four years, I'm getting much more into uh, landscape and birds as well as people. Um, but I find they recharge me in different ways, you know, that if you think about being an introvert or an extrovert, an introvert is someone who is, kind of recharges their batteries by being alone, an extrovert does it by being around other people. I think I'm both. Whenever I do those personality tests, I'm right in the middle of introverted and extroverted. So I think landscape and birding is alone time and it recharges me. And working with people, interacting, collaborating, you know, as part of a team also invigorates me, but in a different way, but it probably leaves me more tired than the, the birding one does. That was a long answer. Let's see if there's any in the room here. <coughs> okay, yes. Uh, Carlos Aldina, any idea where next year's travel event will be? Uh, Carlos, do you, what do you mean exactly by travel event? Do you mean like where am I going to travel next or where am I going to lead tours, that kind of thing? Um, please let me know and I'll be happy to clarify. But I can tell you I'm headed to Bhutan over Christmas and New Year. I have a sponsor child there, so heading back, joining the, their local community uh, annual festival, which happens to be right around Christmas and New Year, although it's not based on that. Um, so that is going to be spectacular, I think. Uh, JR, what's the best way to start making money with all this gear? I've heavily invested in three different systems and never turned any money with that. Um, you don't have to. Not every hobby has to generate income and you might find that having a profit incentive actually takes away from the enjoyment of you actually just going out there and shooting. It's hard to know what's the best way for you to start making money because I don't know what you're shooting, but I would say there's a couple of options if it's a service that you can offer where that you're taking photos for that people may value, whether it's the person for themselves or you go into events and then it could be the event or the, the band or the whatever that could value it, or you're making art that could be just generally sold. If you're in your position where you're doing something and heavily invested and you're loving it, I wouldn't just, uh, it's kind of the opposite advice I would give someone who, if they were really looking to start out and really do a business, it sounds like you just want to turn a buck here or there. So for you to not mess up your enjoyment, I would say, look at what you're doing and who the potential market is and then what kind of products that market would appreciate and then figure out how that you reach them. So kind of work at it from that perspective. Marcilano saying, I bought the Pink House tutorial, awesome information and very well produced, highly recommend it, thank you. That's really kind of you to say, thank you very much. Um, Carlos, the tours. Um, uh, sorry, I just kind of caught the sec next question, the scatterbrain. Um, so he was asking what are the upcoming tours. So I'm tossing up right now between running one or two tours in 2024 or holding them till the following year, but I will be doing workshops in 2024 for sure. 
that kind of rhymed. Um, I'm thinking the, that I'll do one in London, one in New York, and then potentially uh, Singapore, and another one in Europe in terms of workshops. So that's the idea of where I'm going for those. And I'm hoping, considering running tours, like two week long, you know, uh, you join us for the entire time, trips to Iceland and Bhutan, again, to new areas that I haven't run them before, that I've been to, but I haven't taken guests before. Um, last question, then I'll get back to the photos and please send in more questions, I'll answer them later. It's great to make this two way. Ashish Tamain, Tam Tamhain, does the concept of the decisive moment still exist with the arrival of the global shutter? Um, I mean, I feel like sometimes all the technology, and I mean, I'm as guilty or more guilty than most people with the kind of range of technology that I have, that we can kind of lose sight of things and it's partly marketing hype and whatever, but um, a good shot is still a good shot. Or the, sh the winner of this competition, it doesn't matter if it was shot on medium format, on film, on digital, on an iPhone, a good shot is a good shot. And you would have to be a pretty insufferable fanboy or gear nerd if when you see just a drop dead gorgeous image or a stunning war photo or you know some devastating piece of journalism that when you look at the image, your first thought isn't, where is this, what's going on? who's the artist, who are the people in the shot, that kind of thing. If your first question was actually, what camera was this taken with, it's, there's something wrong. And I don't think that that's what most people are thinking. So to answer you directly, yes, timing still matters. Saying with a global shutter, does that, is that gone? Well, I think no, because sure, now instead of taking one frame a second on your film camera like Cartier Bresson may have been, you can take 120 frames a second, but you're not going to be spraying the entire time. It may mean that there's a bit more culling. It may mean that you're able to get the exact frame that you want. But I would argue what makes a great image isn't that you got off 20 shots and you're able to select the very best with the eyes completely open or blah, blah, blah. It's that you took the effort to go to the place where the action's going on, that you have the experience to find the interesting vantage point rather than just standing six foot tall pointing straight at your subject, that you've correctly exposed it, that you've put together a frame where the different elements tell a story. That's all to do with capturing the, the, the right version of the moment and technology doesn't help you with that experience and having an eye is what that requires. Um, good question. All right, let's jump back and look at a few more. Okay, so it looks like this is a storm chaser, I'm guessing, or a very interesting version of Google Maps. Um, yeah, it must be a storm chase. You look at all of the wind turbines. This must be crazy weather country. Um, I quite like it. It's interesting. I like the little addition that we're seeing that he's headed northeast on the the rear screen there. Um, it tells a story. Um, it's not like a technically perfect kind of shot, but if you were doing a story, you know, like the travel photography guide that I'm giving away, it's about how normally travel photography is an a uh, shot that tell, that is the story. If you were doing a, 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 you know, if you're going to Japan, then it would be a series of images that tell the story of where you're going. And if you were telling the story of storm chasing and this guy and his travels through Kansas, 
then this kind of an image absolutely would make the cut to show the kind of what goes into it and how he's got a custom thing made up to hold his laptop in place and the dongle for his Wi-Fi and all of that, that there's, and the, the whole rig with the camera and everything, that the amount of effort that goes into this uh, frenetic moment. Um, I think it's a cool shot. And a much more typical picture postcard type shot now. Uh, I thought the horizon looked a little off. It's only ever so slightly, but no, it's not really. The positioning of the boat is nice. Um, look, I like everyone. I like seeing a, um, a the natural frame, I think, works reasonably well. I do feel, especially in travel photography, that it can sometimes be really overdone. Not criticizing this shot. I think here it works fairly well. It's not too labored and it's not unnecessary. But so often I see shots that would just be great spectacular shots but have been half obscured because they want to put them amongst a bunch of autumn maple leaves or something. I don't know, it becomes uh, just an Instagram influencer photo technique of everything has to be framed with leaves or flowers or something like that. Um, but this, I think, in one sense, it looks like a casual but very well done snapshot in another, quite a thoughtful shot in terms of the composition. Um, and I appreciate that it hasn't had the colors pushed too much to go, you know, into crazy town. So that's nice. Um, this looks like a Day of the Dead type shot. Look, it's an awesome costume. Um, and body paint, uh, all of that looks great. The, there's two things. Uh, one you can't really help, one you can. So the one you can, it seems quite obvious to me this is a woman who's there performing, to asking for tips outside of a big tourist location. Um, in all of this great stuff, not a model that you're working with exclusively now. That, that's not necessarily a bad thing, um, but two ways you could go on that point. One, you could actually say, you know, so you're normally getting a dollar a photo, how about I'll give you $10, but then you come with me for half an hour and we'll make some really interesting shots that don't have all of these tourists in the background. That would be one way that you could go about it. Or you could still you know, give the dollar or whatever to be polite, to help her, but then take some shots that show the reality of the situation, show all of the different buskers and performers together and the tourists taking selfies and all of that to show the real scene and what's going on. This feels like it's trying to be a character portrait, but then it's just so busy. And that's the second point. The people in the background, I don't feel uh, are clearly making a comment on the reality of travel, it feels like just this was the best attempt at clearing up the background, but it hasn't succeeded. So I would go one of the two routes. Okay, now can we just see these at normal? <coughs> I've got a little bit of a cough today. Sorry, guys. Um, Angels, ladies, parking, all night parking for the brothel. There you go. Um, is the brothel in the, the derelict plane? That's um, not going to offer a whole lot of privacy. Uh, I wonder if this is actually shot on Kodak Portra 400 or if that's the, just a border that's been added. Um, I do like the old signs, the derelict feeling. Quite cool that there's a plane right there. I think in this instance, the border of the film actually works quite well and the colors are all beautiful. Again, this would really, I think, need to be part of a series where you were, you know, looking at old Nevada and the decaying buildings or 
looking into the prostitution industry, that kind of thing, where this is a, how things used to be or a relic of a bygone era, that kind of thing. I don't know that as a standalone image uh, it, it's strong enough, but as part of a series would be, but it is interesting. Uh, let's just check. Let's go back. Any other questions here? The Dark Slide. Elliot Erwitt died recently. He never had a global shutter and shot most of his work on film with da da da. 99.9% .9 of photographers. Um, sorry, my screen is playing up. Today won't be better than him. Sure. Um, I think that that's what it comes down to. It's not ever the tech. There, there are times, like, there are things where, you know, my Z9 lets me get shots that I would have missed with my old D850. That the better focus and the better tracking does mean if I were shooting the men's 100 meter finals, I'll have more and better options to choose from. And that's great, but that's, and there are creative sports shots and da 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 da. But the really, the shots that stick with us, that are poignant or powerful or artistic or creative, that comes down to people putting the shot together. And like J.R. Weather says, you don't ask a chef what kind of oven he used just because the meal's delicious. That's true, and I think it, it, the gear is in a way irrelevant, but having certain things, resolution or autofocus or the right focal lengths or the right film stock, it is all part of the creative process. And just pulling back a little bit here, I don't think we need to beat ourselves up as photographers about this because I bet you in cooking circles, people who are way into baking, they do lust after the latest model oven or the most antique one that has the most traditional way of cooking. People say uh, painters don't go on and on about their brushes. It's not true. I do have friends who are painters who are all about their brushes and jealous of other people's brush collection and using $500 brushes and then others that are virtuosos that can get any $2 brush from the corner store and paint a masterpiece. Um, it's not just us. So, you know, it's kind of easy to get in a bubble and think we face all these unique challenges. I don't think it's true. Um, I have three more questions here on Instagram. Richard Gola, do you think medium format photos from Hasselblad are that much better than full frame sensor? I'm on the verge of getting the Hasselblad X2D. <coughs> I'm glad you qualified with which camera exactly because there's so many different medium format cameras. Now the X2D and the Fuji GFX 100s are using the same sensor, so that levels it all out. But, you know, if you go back to previous Hasselblad cameras or phase one cameras, that kind of thing. They have significantly bigger sensors again and significantly bigger price tags as well. So that's a whole different ball game. Um, it sounds like you're on the verge, you wanna buy it. Are you looking to me to enable you or do, what are you looking for here? Um, are they that much better? They are better. You do get uh, deeper files. I think the X2D, for my taste, and it is personal, has the best colors of any camera system I've ever used of any format. Um, will you notice it for your style of work? I don't know. Will you agree to your taste that it's the best? I don't know. Um, and also keep in mind, if you're comparing a flagship full frame or the X2D, the full frame is going to have lots more bells and whistles and the potential of global shutter and eye tracking and a million frames a second and, and, and. The X2D does now have face detect autofocus, but it's not continuous focus. It's much faster than previous generations, but it's not going to be as fast as your full frame camera. It is, however, going to be double the resolution and, you know, just beautiful files. 
but with a much more limited and more expensive lens range because they have the leaf shutter built in and you just don't have you know 1.2 primes and 2.8 zooms like you do for full frame so yeah i shoot both chris dellinger one regret you done in photography one thing you regret having done in photography um another negative slant on it but thank you for the question question chris it's still a good one you learn from your mistakes one regret in photography. I don't want to come across as like one of those motivational gurus, but I do think um, not taking chances early on when the stakes were a bit lower and, you know, waiting for everything to be perfect or that, you know, was probably a bit of a mistake. Um, I would say the, the times where things haven't worked out as well as they should have, almost always I can point back to, it was either that I didn't put in the work necessary to prepare and plan for it, or something I've noticed regularly, often, and I don't know that this is even good advice, it's just personal, that when I go and I wanna do a project, and I think, okay, I'm missing 50% of the skills. Okay, I need to build all of that up or learn it, but then still do it under my name as a solo venture. When I put in the work, they tend to be very successful. When I've said, well, let me team up with this person. They have these skills, I have these skills. They have that audience, I have this audience. Bringing it together should be like a synergy and we get both audiences and both skill sets. In my experience, it's been less successful and it's like kind of you're dividing the interest because if there isn't enough overlap between the two, you don't have people wanting to see both of us and learning both the things, they end up feeling like, well, I'm only actually interested in half of it now rather than in all of it. Um, yeah, that's probably it. Um, I have to say I'm kind of proud with how I did things in terms of purchasing and equipment early on that I never went into debt to buy equipment uh, that I, you know, it, it was only 10 years ago that we were, had very, very, very little money and were super careful with what we were spending and I only worked out of the house, had no space before we went to the cheapest office in Sydney then, you know, the a slightly nicer place and then a slightly nicer place and then moved to New York. But still there are things that I purchased that I thought would make a difference that just really didn't, that were probably a waste of money at the time. Um, yeah, so if you're looking for takeaways that you could apply to your own, I would say don't, don't think that spending an extra $2,000 on a lens is going to somehow bring you an extra $2,100 in profits that will offset itself. Um, don't spend that, don't spend money you don't have on things that aren't critical. Um, last couple of questions on here. Just got on GTM photo, first time entering a pic taken on film. Ah, good, we actually just talked about your shot and I like it, so you'll have to rewind to watch that. Rob Fleetwood, when you do travel abroad, how do you, do you plan an itinerary yourself or use an external company? Um, for Bhutan, I have a guide that I work with that I've been working with for the five or six times that I've been to Bhutan already. And then we discuss different options, where I wanna go, what I think is great for a, a trip to take guests along. Um, Bhutan's kind of an unusual one. There are some things that I can like do my research and then go to him and say, I'm interested to go here and see this and do this. Can we make it happen? But there's so much of what goes on there that just is not online that you wouldn't know how to search for it. Like I would say 99.5% of tourists don't go to Bhutan. Of those that do, 90% go to this region. 
only 10% go over here and maybe only 5% of them will get to the major center where my uh, sponsor child lives. But then basically no one goes to his family's village, which is another five hours hike from that area to their festival. So it's not online. There's no photos of it anywhere. I wouldn't be able to find out when it's even on if I didn't have a local there who can call someone, contact someone in the community, talk to this monk who knows someone there, who knows the celestial charts, who can figure out when their ceremony is likely to be, and then see if I'm able to attend it somehow. So, but for most countries, I do the majority of the legwork myself. Hi to CJ Majesty. Thanks for joining us, mate. Um, let's jump back, look at the last couple of photos and choose our selves out a winner so gtm i'm guessing this was your shot your first shot shot on film and i actually i saw on your uh ig i think there's a shot of your lovely partner in front of this sign so i guess this is yours okay i'm guessing a film shot or heavily texturized to look like a film shot. Nice timing with the bikes coming out under the tree. Uh, looks like doing a, a run early in the morning to go pick something up. Um, without seeing the name, this feels like a Milan shot to me. We Shots that we get from this guy always seem to be timeless and you can't tell what era they were taken in. Um, this feels like another one of those. Definitely qualifies within the travel theme. Uh, okay, well this is a different take on it. It's got travel trunks, so I guess this qualifies as a travel shot. It's kind of hard to compare it to the other images there, but now that we have said it qualifies, let's just take a look at the shot and... Um, see what feedback we have as a studio portrait. I mean, the exposure's really good. If you wanted to take it up to the next level, you could retouch out some of the shadows on the floor. Um, I, to be honest, I kind of feel like this was shot as a studio shot, and this is no problem but just shot as a, a retro pinup type shot and then thought, hey, there's a travel comp on, let me enter it to that rather than shooting this as a travel shot because uh, I don't think that this um, record or poster or whatever it is in the corner fits the theme. It's basically the fly the world above the crowd uh, luggage cases that make it qualify. Um, and I'm not 100% sure on the perspective on this, nor on the level, nor on the eye position, having so much white eye to the camera. It's kind of coy and playful, that kind of thing, but I don't know that it really makes sense. If you were outside a train station and looking at somebody sitting on the crates, then that makes sense. But in this white studio background, um, it's hard to generate a feeling of mystery and drama against a high key white background um and then it kind of the her facial feature facial posing is like i said trying to create drama and tell a story but then with the the stylized set especially having this picture in here it doesn't really make sense i think if it were black and white and without this poster, then her pose and everything makes sense. Otherwise, having eye contact and uh, a playful look would work. The only thing I can think is that the poster is looking to the right, camera right, and so is she, so that's the link. Um, this looks like a familiar station, but I could be wrong. Um, so, 
I don't want to get all ranty on this, but I'm personally not a fan of selective color like this, and I'll tell you why. When you're composing an image, it's just normal that you want to put emphasis, more emphasis on some things and less on others. And there's lots of ways that you can do that with the simple controls of your camera that we can tell the viewer what we think is the most important. We can put the important things closer, making them bigger. We can have them in focus and then have the foreground or background out of focus. That tells us that that subject is important. We can have them sharp and allow other things to be blurry. It could be by bokeh or it could be with movement. We can use color. We can have our subject warmer and the background cooler. There's lots of different ways that, or we can add more light to our subject so they're brighter and the other areas of the frame are darker. We can have leading lines running to our subject. Lots and lots of ways that we can put emphasis on what we want the viewer to pay most attention to. In my opinion, just desaturating everything and leaving something else most often red be colored in the shot is like a really, I don't want to say lazy, but like a, a one click way of there's no clear subject in a shot. So a lot of people will do that to just give it a little bit of extra oomph that wasn't in the file. I'm not saying that's necessarily what was done here. I would say your subject is this woman um, and you could have potentially kept it as a, well, let's just see, kept it as a black and white, but then cropped in so that she is, you know, we have the, the train, the leading line of the train pointing attention to her already. There we have a shot with the moving train and she is our subject. It looks like her dress may have been brightened up already anyway. You could do a little bit of dodging and burning on this to put the emphasis on her in a much more relaxed and natural feeling way. I don't know that the, for my taste, and sorry, but as the judge, my taste is kind of, um, it does matter in this case. Um, for my taste, I don't think the selective color adds to the shot. I think it takes away from it and you're totally fine to disagree with my opinion and go ahead and print this and enter it to every competition. I'm not right, it's just an opinion. And I think that is the last of our shots here. Let me know what you guys uh, think of the entries we had. I have one more question here, um, or two. Um, for the questions I had entered. Um, but sorry, let's take a look at my flag shots. Okay. Oh, it's a bit hard. I'm going to think on it a moment and answer the last question and then come back to give our winner. Um, <coughs> okay. Uh, Bram, who I think is one of the entries we have here, thanks for replying to my message. Uh, Kind of a long question, but it starts out with, have you ever, do you have experience printing on aluminium? Um, and then problems he's having with it. And no, I don't, I'm sorry, I haven't done aluminum prints, so I unfortunately can't give you any help on that. He goes on to talk about how the one he's seen faded. I think it, up oh, there's the construction. 
I think it comes down to like anything in printing, finding a really top quality one that gives consistent, reliable results and the people are reliable and good to deal with. It takes a lot of legwork. The good printers I've found over the years really do take some time to find and, you know, get up and running with. Um, David Stevens, if this one isn't too late, I want to add another. Uh, if you were starting your career over from scratch now, what advice would current you give newly starting you, if that makes sense? Um, so I guess it's what would you do differently? I, it's really hard to say because you, uh, in any career, again, I don't think this is specific to photography, you, especially if you're working for yourself, not like in a salary job, you make progress, you face challenges, you identify new opportunities in the market, basically where are the gaps and then you head there and then you see an opportunity and you put a lot of time and effort into it and you kind of end up where you end up. If I look at where I am now, there'd be a temptation to look back and say to myself 15 years ago, in 2022 and 2023, uh, AI editing and global shutters are going to be all the rage. You need to start getting yourself ready for that. I don't think that would really help because I've had success each year. So I guess it, the advice would be to um, maybe see what I've done that's been successful, that's general, you know, like um, this works better in tours, this works better in courses. This is what you need to do when working with brands and just try and help myself learn that stuff earlier. I don't know that I would have any huge differences because this sounds, again, I don't want to sound like Tony Robbins or something, but you know, 10 or 15 years ago, I sat down and literally wrote a business plan and a plan for this is how I want my life to look. This is how I want my personal life to look, my work, my family life, my ability to travel, you know, kind of like a dream of, I want to be able to have this lifestyle. And I kind of achieved it in six or eight years and then had to sit down and rewrite new plans. So maybe I would say set even bigger goals and then who knows where I would be at right now. Um, All right, so I think that's all the questions that we have had come in. So let me then choose our winners. Now that construction is really drumming on, oh, I think it's a good time to end. Now to the point of that I don't think you need to care too much about the equipment it's about the moment and the story being told I'm pretty sure this was taken on a cell phone because it says it was at 6.1 millimeter but I've just noticed that after I'm deciding to give this our first prize so congratulations to Phil Lloyd Good, cool shot and I'm gonna give our runner-up to Lenny Thompson um, Great shot, I already gave the feedback, just be more careful on your masking. And uh, commended, whatever, uh, thank you for entering, great shot to Bram. You just won last month, so I think we'll um, just give you as a high commendation for this one, great shot. Um, I haven't actually announced what the December theme is. I will soon make sure you're signed up at mattgranger.com because I'll send out an email once I've set that up. Um, I'll actually be in Bhutan over the New Year, so the judging will be a little later, but I'll announce it really soon what the theme's going to be. Uh, if you have any suggestions of what you would like the December theme to be, leave it as a comment below. Um, you can check out the, the prizes that we're giving away, um, and I should have mentioned at the top, Sal Digital, who sponsored last month's show, um, aren't sponsoring this month's one, but they did say that their 50% off wall art is going on till the end of the year. So if you wanted to get something printed for yourself, you can check out, there's a link in the description below. Thanks guys. Hope you have a great weekend. 
I'll see you soon.